Hi everyone, uh, uh, my name is Carla Jardine. I'm an architectural lighting designer. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Martin Sharon for this opportunity to share the presentation that I did recently in, in Lighting Europe 2024 in London, uh, just last month. And uh, yes, um, that's all. I'm, I'm very glad and happy to, to be here. Okay, so let's start. Um, as I said before, um, I'm an architectural lighting designer and I'm going to give you just a little brief introduction of my background. Um, I'm uh, trained in architecture. I've worked in different fields and I found my passion in lighting design uh, when I was living in Barcelona, Spain. Uh, there, uh, I started work with lighting design in different fields. I worked as uh, uh, for manufacturer, uh, suppliers, doing light installation for light uh, festivals. And uh, more about um, uh, eight years ago, I joined uh, the Flaming Beacon lighting designers uh, at the Berlin office. And um, yeah, the, the, the it's a uh, TFB is a Australian company which has an office in Melbourne and another one in Berlin, and I've been working with them since then. Uh, the talk I did uh, for the Enlightening Europe this year it's called "Now You See Me, Do You?" I started telling about light and inclusion. Um, in this storytelling, um, I'll show you how um, dark skin tones are perceived in lighting design. Um, I'll go through some samples in lighting design fields and disciplines where um, light is the key factor to talk about those uh, stories, uh, such as in cinematography, um, photography, and also how uh, architectural lighting design can and should support uh, creating more uh, inclusive spaces. So this um, the storytelling is uh, it's uh, uh, is guided uh, with a lot of emotions and um, and considerations because it's a topic that it's very close to me. And um, it's about perception, about perception of the other and how it, this other is perceived uh, on the space. So it's a storytelling of how one sees um, the other. Uh, it's the storytelling is in four blocks. Uh, we will start with photography, then we move to cinematography, stage lighting, and the uh, last, architectural lighting. So this is me. This is also me, but a little bit lighter. Okay, and this is Derek May. Derek May is a Detroit-based uh, the techno DJ. So why Derek May is here in the presentation today? Um, uh, my husband is um, an architect, and he's really into techno music. Uh, he was reading an article in a magazine once, a long time ago, uh, where it was talking about Detroit and the revitalization through uh, Black culture and Black music. And Derek May was in this uh, article being interviewed. So uh, sometime later on, uh, Derek May goes to Athens, so my husband's Greek. So Derek May goes to Athens and he's going to DJ there. Uh, my husband has this opportunity to interview him, and uh, here we go. Here he goes with the magazine, and uh, to meet uh, Derek May for this interview. Uh, they are talking, and then he opens up this uh, the magazine, and then he shows uh, Derek May the magazine and the article. On the article, the article there was a photo from Derek May, and. When he showed this article with the photo, Derek May started saying, sorry, but this guy is not me. And my husband got a little bit surprised. Uh, How come it's not you? This is you. And Derek May kept saying from that moment on that, sorry, this is not me. This is not me. This is not me. And by that time, my husband could understand what had happened there, why Derek May kept saying that it wasn't him. 
It's just that he kind of couldn't recognize himself through that photo. So um, I'll come back to that image later on the, uh, during the storytelling. But uh, basically what happened is Derek May couldn't uh, recognize, recognize himself on those images. Uh, it's like that those images weren't, wasn't talking about his truth, wasn't talking about him. So he wasn't feeling included. Okay, so let's start through photography. Um, uh, I read an article uh, from uh, Shirita McFadden, who is a photographer, a black photographer, and um, this is a quote from her, from her art, from the article, uh, where she she was when she was a kid. She was sitting uh, together with her family uh, on the kitchen table, and uh, her mother had just brought some photos that she had just collected from the professional photographer. And they were all in family having a look on those photos that she has just uh, developed. Um, they were shocked when they were checking the photos. They couldn't recognize themselves. They were looking all uh, odd, completely different from how they are. They said that the um, the 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 her mother wasn't blurred, was blurred. Uh, her hair wasn't uh, rendered the way supposed to be rendered, uh, facial expressions were not seen. It was kind of, uh, uh, they couldn't recognize themselves through those images. So for her, photography is a balance between uh, light and documentary, and it's about telling a story which should be honest. And uh, for her, uh, that frame those images were how the photographer who was behind the camera was seeing them. So she couldn't help the feeling that how this photographer could get them so wrong, how they could he could see them in a way that they haven't seen them ever before, like not really telling the truth. Uh, so she has this quote, it's that it's, uh, is that how you see me? Could you not see blackness? Is it varying tones and textures? And you can see us all this way? Okay, so continue on. Um, from the 40s until the 70s, Kodak used to have those um, Shirley cards, which were cards that were using during the development, uh, the developing the film uh, process. So you used to have those um, cards so you could uh, get the colors right properly. So the Chile card consisted in um, a color palette on the bottom and at the side black and white, uh, different grays, and also a light uh, skin tone module. Uh, um, from the 70s, uh, Kodak uh, changed their films and then they became a little bit more inclusive, creating the motion ratio um, Charlie cards. So the Charlie cards, just so you know, it, it's, uh, it's called like that because the first model was called Shirley and since then all the cards became with this name, even though the models are not the same. So with this card, um, what happened in Kodak is not that it got the motivation behind, however, wasn't because of the subject that was uh, to be rendered properly. It was about um, other uh, um, interest, industry interest. So what happened? They were getting a lot of complaints from uh, two industry, the furniture manufacturers and the chocolate makers. In the case of the furniture make, uh, manufacturers, uh, they were complaining about that on the pictures, you couldn't see the different, uh, the shades of brown of the wood. So the woods were all looking the same. And in the case of the chocolate makers, uh, they were not getting the difference between the dark chocolate and the milk chocolate on the photos. So in this case, yes, Kodak became more inclusive, but what was the motivation behind it wasn't the subject of the individual or other matters. 
Uh, nowadays, we have the we pass from analog to digital, and a lot can be done in post production, and also all the technologies and programs that you use in post production. But um, I am bringing two um, black photographers that what they do is that they try to work before post production. So what they do here is try to to empower, to tell a true story of the subjects that are being re, uh, portrayed in his photos. So he tried to bring the beauty and being honest with all the blackness that can be seen, the different uh, uh, tones and undertones from the dark skin tone. So he used also some, they both use uh, makeup and use a uh, reflected makeup so they could get better light on, on, on the different uh, tones of skin. So moving on to cinematography, um, uh, got this quote from Anna Berkowski, which is a director of photography. So she was saying that uh, um, while she was in film school, uh, she had a class was telling that told a teacher that told her how to light dark skin tone. That was a rule mixing two uh, color filters, and then you get it uh, the to light all the dark skin tones. So what she 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 got curious was that how come it could be treated that all dark skin tones are the same, which is not. So she was questioning this universal rule that uh, how come this universal rule will work with all dark skin types, light the subject individually regardless the skin tone. So um, I brought this movie, which is Lilies of um, Fields from, uh, uh, from 63 with Sidney Poitier. Um, it's a movie about nuns. They are living on the mountains, on a village mountain. And then um, for them, God brought them, uh, Sidney Poitier, to help he, them to um, construct this, um, um, to construct their convent. So um, here, uh, what was said is that, yes, uh, they tried their best to light Sidney Poitier. Uh, they did an okay job, but it, it's Sidney Poitier, so he should have been a spectacular light for him because it's huge. Uh, but uh, what they were saying is that is this dif difficulty, which I would, uh, wouldn't call difficulty, I would call challenge, when you have two different skin tones, a light skin tone and a dark skin tone on the same scene. But um, I consider that if you understand the scene being like a composition, where you shouldn't be uh, um, thinking about the amount of light or the intensity, because then you can overlead uh, the dark skin tone. It's more about how you can combine and study individually uh, the light skin tone, the dark skin tone, and make this composition create a balance, like if it was uh, a painting. Uh, this is an example of a series called Boardwalk Empire. Uh, it's a series about gangsters. This is uh, uh, Charlie Wa uh, White. Uh, so Charlie White is one of the main characters, very bad, bad gangster. But in this scene, I consider like a, a, a failure uh, in terms of lighting because um, it's a flat image. Uh, being him the one of the most uh, important gangsters from the series, he should be popping out from the the image. But all the actors, they are all under the same light. There is no hierarchy. Um, there is a try uh, using the the dress, the dresses, the costume to create some contrast. But everything is blending uh, behind with the background, you can understand the facial expressions. They look concerned, but um, everything is flat. Everything is under the same light. N there were no individual study to make it this uh, scene and the light work properly. 
moving forward in cinematography, there are some examples where um, the, the, the director of photography has a little bit, he's caring about the story that he wants to tell. So this is Ava Berkowski, it's the same from the coat. Uh, she here is, she's taking care of every single detail on the scene. She's taking care about the background with some subtle light. She's also thinking about um, uh, experimenting, uh, using different uh, color filters to, to for individually for each character to bring their best to render and bring all this blackness uh, uh, with empowerment. This is another uh, example. Uh, it's from a film, a Brazilian film called Medida Provisoria. Most of the actors on this film, they are um, uh, black actors. And here you can see that there's also uh, some care about telling the, the, the story. So you can see that each um, actor is lit individually on the photo of the, on the right. So you can see even what it's written. There is, you, you understand their facial expressions, uh, their concerns. Even on, on the colored uh, image, uh, on the first one, you can see that uh, it's, even though it's a harsh light, a uh, colored background, you can still understand what it's happening. Each one was taken care of. So it's um, it's about the study. It's about how you want the the situation to be read. It's about how you want uh, things to be to be seen, to be perceived. It's taking care of each one of the actors. Is is thinking that uh, if it was like um, um, a painting, when you're doing a, a face show, um, a face painting, you try to understand all the the elements, so the proportions, uh, the light, the texture, the shades. So it, it's about there. It's about caring and trying to tell a true story, a beautiful story. So moving on to uh, stage lighting, I came across to two examples. Uh, the first one um, I consider poetical in a certain way, and the other one uh, more technical, but both are very good examples on how um, uh, the stage lighting uh, treat uh, and perceive dark skin tones. So this is a project uh, from uh, Raquel Rosedet, um, I had the opportunity to meet her because she's based in Berlin. And uh, when we were discussing, she explained to me um, about her work. So she's the architectural lighting designer, but she's been working with stage light uh, for a long time. So uh, what uh, happened is that she had uh, uh, to work on a, on a play when most of the actors uh, were dark skin tones. And uh, she set the scene with the light and with her knowledge. And once uh, it was finished, she could see that uh, something wasn't working properly. Uh, that she, all the rules and all the the type of light that she was using uh, wasn't um, for dark skin tones, were for light skin tone. So it wasn't working in that case. So what she did, she dropped all um, that information that he had before and started from scratch. So she decided to start uh, each character, each actor individually, including the background of the, uh, the scenery. And um, she uh, tested with different uh, color filters so she could uh, achieve the proper and the best um, light for each one of the characters. So she has this quote which says that the interface between the bodies on stage and the light that make them visible is the skin. Our bodies are surrounded by history and society and the skin is the layer that tells our stories. So what uh, Raquel was saying and what she did is that she started questioning this universal body, this universal solution, the universal being. Her project is called uh, Colors in Between, and uh, I really recommend everyone to have a look. Uh, so what she does is that she plays normally with two or three uh, color filters and light, and uh, depending on the different um, 
uh, skin tone, she gets a combination of um, colors. And uh, what came from this uh, research is that she has now a kit what she cares with her, uh, which is she cares with her. And then every time she has a, a dark skin tone um, in 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 the um, on the play. She uses that as a, a, a tool, now became like a, a resource for her. The other project that I consider like a crossover between stage lighting, architectural lighting, but it's more um, like uh, towards architectural lighting. And um, it's a project called Dermatology from Natalie Rosat. Uh, what she does is that she does a, a research, a, a technical and scientific research between relating a visual perception, light spectrum, and uh, the reflectance uh, of uh, different uh, skin tones, mainly uh, uh, dark skin tones. And from that research, the intention is that of, at the end, you got uh, like a, a kit as well, like a set, where you have uh, your own light that you can carry with you and then you can light your, your, yourself. So then finally, architectural lighting. Um, so for me, uh, I consider that lighting design is not only about lighting the spaces. Of course, it's architectural lighting design. Uh, as the name says, architectural, but uh, it's. I think it's. It, I consider that it's much more than just lighting the architecture. It's also about uh, about lighting the people that is going to inhabit those spaces and tell their own stories. So while I was doing this, um, yeah, this research and preparing this talk, these are the, my findings in, in this case. Yeah. Not much. Didn't find much about uh, architecture, not to say any. Um, so what a, 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 I'm questioning, you know, so we have all this technology, we have the tunable white uh, high fidelity, uh, we have TM13, CRI, R9, we have all these information and we are not able to, to make more inclusive spaces. So um, let's, let's think for a moment. So we are uh, narrators, we are storytellers. So we've got the technology. Uh, so we have the means. Uh, I don't know. And before, let's say we didn't know, but now we are all aware. Now we know. So also we are we know that there are no universal solutions and we are thinking there are no universal spaces. So uh, it becomes to an end that it's a decision, it's a choice to do things in a different way. So I started this uh, talk with uh, more questions than answers. And um, I think that the, those are the questions that I, I'll, I'll start to use from now on, on, on my project and to think when I'm around on the space. Um, it's like uh, when designing the lighting for a space, do we consider the diversity of people, the variety of skin tones that we inhabit interact in the space? How can we use apply lighting to create more inclusive spaces? Isn't it a great challenge to light a space where every skin can shine it its own way and tell its own story? That would be amazing. So um, I have some uh, stories, two stories about diversity and inclusion. One of them is uh, uh, the Black Cultural Archives uh, that is in Brixton in London. It's the, um, the home they call for Black British history. Um, I had the opportunity to talk uh, with OK Sorted, which uh, um, with Anika Simmons, and she's the strategist of the communication for the, the Black Archives. And she was telling me that the Black Archive is done for the locals, for the community to the Black community. But they also want that um, the, 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 the archives to be visited by others. They want to be accessible 
to everyone. So in their communication strategy, they, they need to find a point where they communicate with the locals, but at the same time, they are accessible to everyone. So, um, uh, for example, this poster is a poster that she explained that it's written, when trouble come, ink, happy, run. Meaning, explain, that uh, when something wrong happens, you need to write it down. Uh, if you are local and you're from that area, you know exactly what that means. But if you uh, are not from there, so you need to be able to understand what it's this exhibition about. So the exhibition about is a, uh, it's written in small underneath the big titles uh, that is celebrating Black Ink publishing legacy, housing together the books, uh, pamphlets, and the artwork for the first time in 45 years. Meaning that the locals know that when we talk about uh, the ink that we run, you're talking about books, publishing. And in the case of, um, uh, for the, the others to be accessible for the others, you then understand that it's what you exactly going to see, but it's a books and publishing uh, exhibition. The other story is a story about, um, uh, a book that I used to read when I was a kid, and uh, now I read a lot to my daughter. And uh, it's a book uh, from Ziraldo, a Brazilian author, and the name of the book is Flix. Um, I've, I've shown this image before in another presentation, but it's because it's a, a very beautiful story. Um, Flix, it's a color. So Flix is a color that doesn't fit anywhere. So it doesn't fit in the color of the, um, the rainbow. It doesn't fit on the pencil case. Um, it can be used to color uh, trees. It can be used to color landscape. It can be used to color the sun. Um, Flix thinks that there is no space for him. So instead of being sad and feeling sorry of himself, uh, Flix decided to 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 tell his own story, to become his, through him. Flix decided to be the color of the moon. So now you see me, don't you? Thank you very much.